welcome to the Healing and Meditation Club's Bhagavad Gita from beginning. And uh, this is our eighth session. Um, and we're still obviously on chapter two. And we'll be doing chapter uh, verse 17 today. Uh, this room uh, was created because um, <clears throat> uh, quite a few of us um, wanted to understand uh, the Bhagavad Gita um, and its messages and how we can apply it um, in our lives today. Uh, by no means uh, are any of us um, experts necessarily um, on the Bhagavad Gita, but we do have a deep desire to understand the teachings of Lord uh, Krishna, what he was uh, imparting to um, Arjuna uh, and hence to us. So um, with that, uh, should we begin with the prayer? Over to you, Aditya, for Narayan Sutra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Sahasra Chira Chandevam Vipvaktam Vipvashambhuvam Vipvam Narayanam Devam Aksharam Paramam Param Vipvatap Paramar Nityam Vipvam Narayanapagam Param Vishma Vedam Purushastatvishma Mupajivati Patam Vishma Shyatmeshvara Gamsha Shvara Gamshiva Machutam Narayanam Mahatmeyam Vishma Atmanam Parayanam Narayana Paro Jyotiratma Narayana Parah Narayana Param Dhammatatpam Narayana Parah Nara yana paro dhyata dhyanam nara yana parah Gatcha kintinja gattalvam pishishyate eshuryate piva Antar parhishka tattalvam vyapya nara yana sitah Anantam apyayam tavikum samutrentam vishpasham bhuvam Patma koshapsati pashukum hidayam chapya domukam Adho nishya vitas yante napyam uparitishtati Jwala mala kulam hati vispasya yetanam mahat Santatagam shila pishkulam pasya kocha sandivam Tasyante sushirgam shukam tasmin salvam patishtitam Tasya matke mahanakshi vispasi vispato mukaha so, Krabukti Bajan, Sitan Mahara Majara Sabi, Iria Kutta Madasha, Ilashmatya Yetanam Mahate, Santa Santa Payetis from Dehama Pada Talamastaka, Satya Matke Vanhikita, Anijot Papya Vastita, Nilato Yadamatya Sat, which will lay save a bad Nivara Chuka Vatan Vipita Vat Vatanupama Satya Chipaya Matke Maha Paramatma Pyavatika Sabram Matashi Vatahalisin Vatto Kara Paramat Paras Vitagam Satyam Param Brahma Purushan Krishna Pingalam Utparekam Virupa Kam Vitparupa Yavena Mona Om Narayana Yavitmahe Vatu Devaya Dimahe Tanna Vishupta Chodaya Ate Om Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva Jai Shri Krishna Sumanji, would you like to offer a dhyanam? Sure. Yes. Om Parthaya Pratibhunitam Bhagavatam Narayane Nasvayam Vyase Nagrati Tam Purana Munina Madhye Mahabharatam 
अद्वैतामृतवर्षिणी भगवती मष्टादशायिनी भगवद्गीते भगवदेशिणी नमोस्तुते व्यास विशाल बुद्धे उल्लारविंदय तपत्रनेत्र भारततैलपूर्ण प्रज्वाल ज्ञानमय प्रदीप प्रपन्न पारिजाता स्त्रोत्र वैत्रेक ज्ञान मुद्रा कृष्णा गीतामृतदुहे नम वसुते वसुत कंसचाणूरमर्धन देवकी परमानंद कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु भीष्मद्रोण तटा जयद्रथजल गांधार नीलोत्पला शल्यग्राहवती कृपेण वहिनी कर्णेन वेलाकुला अश्वत्थाम विखर्ण घोरमक दुर्योधनावर्ति सोतीर्णा खलु पांडवैरण नदी कैवर्तक केशवाह पाराशर्यवच सरोज ममल गीतागंधोत्कट नाख्यानकसर हरिकता संबोधना बोधि लोक सज्जन षटदर पेपीयम मुद भूयात पंकज कलिमल प्रध्वंसी न श्रेयसे मूक कौती वाचाल पंगु लंगयते गिरी यम वंदे परमानंदमाधव यं ब्रह्म वरुणेन्द्र रुद्रमुत स्तुन्वती दिव्यस्तव वेद सांगपद्रमोपनिषद गायती साम ध्यानवस्थित तदेन मनसा पश्योगिनो युसुरासुरगुण देवाय तस्म नम शाताकारम भुजगशयन पद्मनाभम सुशम विश्वाधारम गगन सदृश मेघवर्णम शुभांगं लक्ष्मीका कमलनयन योगिध्यानगम्य वंदे विष्णु भवभयहर सर्वोकनाथ कृष्णापणमस्तु Namaste. Thank you, Sumanji. Thank you, Aditya. Um, so today, again, as um, it says, it's chapter two, verse seventeen. And um, as I said, uh, by no means, and definitely, I am not any uh, expert, uh, but I do have a deep desire and question to understand um, what. Uh, the bhagavad gita um is trying to teach us and so after the um the the verses um and we will or i will attempt rather to um recite the verse in um sanskrit and then um j g will translate yes and then we will have an open discussion um on the verse and try to see how we can apply um the teachings in our lives at this time so i will um say ahead of time 
Uh, I am sure there will be mistakes made. I am not someone who um, knows Sanskrit. I'm just beginning to very much beginning to learn. And so please um, excuse any mistakes. Um Avinashi tu tat vidhi ye na sarvam midam tatam vinasham avyasasya na kaschit karto marhati Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Jay, over to you, or... Jay Shri Krishna. So as we've been seeing in this um, second chapter uh, where Lord Krishna is basically offering the essence of the Bhagavad Gita to uh, Arjuna on the Dharamshetra, Kurukshetra battlefield and um, it's it's been a conversation which is now um, pretty much one-sided where uh, now Shri Krishna has entered the role of uh, really showing the truth to Arjuna and um, dispelling the, the doubts, the chaos in his mind any form of questions which he has, so he is removing them one by one, peeling off the layers as we move along the Bhagavad Gita verses and speaking about verse uh, 17 from chapter 2. So what Sukanyaji just recited, if we can do a word-to-word -word translation of that, Shri Krishna is telling Arjuna that know that which per pervades the entire body is indestructible. No one is able to destroy the imperishable soul. So Shri Krishna is basically now entering into the realm of uh, going beyond logic. So from from Tark to Vitarka, which is basically from going from what we know as uh, commonly accepted logic, going into the Vitarka, which goes beyond uh, this humanly known uh, logic which we possess. And uh, to truly understand that, you need to really go beyond the sensory perceptions of the human body. And that's where the concept of soul really comes in. And if we focus on uh, this verse, the, the entire focus, the entire um, the center of attention is on the soul because um, Shri Krishna is basically trying to um, distinguish to Arjuna that the body is different and the soul is different. So the body might get destroyed and perish, whereas there is something inside which cannot be destroyed or which is practically imperishable. And in fact, no one can uh, destroy this soul. So this verse, it clearly explains the the true real nature of the soul, which is in many ways, it is spread all over the body. So in, in true understanding, whatever that is spread all over the body, that is consciousness. 
and if we really pay attention to our own uh, self everyone is um, is conscious of the pains and the pleasures of the body either either in part or as a whole so this we are talking about one's own body our own individual body my body your body so this spreading of consciousness is basically limited within one's own body so my consciousness is limited to my own body so in that context any pain or pleasure of my body cannot be shared with someone else or somebody in this room right now so the pains and pleasures of one body is unknown to another and there is practically no linkage like i cannot i cannot really feel the pain even though i can be empathetic and try and understand your pain and your pleasure but the pain and pleasure which is there inside you the the sense of these these um, sensory uh, perceptions these are only limited to you you cannot really transfer it you cannot really describe it you can probably use few words to describe it but how exactly you are feeling it right now you cannot really let it known to be another person so in that ways each and every body is the embodiment of an individual soul and uh, there therein the symptom of this uh, soul's presence is perceived to be as individual consciousness which is um, limited only to the self and not get transferred to the other person now this soul is basically described as a uh, 1/10th part of the upper portion of the hair point in size and uh, it's spoken in the upanishads where uh, in uh, the shvetashvatvara upanishad in the 5th chapter 9th verse when the upper point of a hair is divided into 100 parts and again each of such parts is further divided into 100 parts each such part is the measurement of the dimension of the spirit soul so this is very very minute in size and therefore the individual particle of the spirit the soul is a spiritual atom smaller than even the material atoms which we know about and these atoms they are uncountable they are just innumerable in quantity and this very small spiritual spark is the basic fundamental principle of the material body and the influence of such a spiritual spark it is spread all over the body and as the influence of the active principle similar to how a medicine spreads throughout the body so you could say like how you apply chandan on your forehead and it not only cools your forehead it cools your entire body so you're applying it at at one spot but it spreads to the entire body so similarly so anybody can understand that the material body when you remove or subtract the consciousness is a dead body and this consciousness cannot be revived in the dead body by any means of any material administration it is true that within maybe few seconds of a heart stroke or um, if you do cpr or probably if you provide electric voltage to the heart you can probably revive a person maybe within the first few seconds or minutes of the heart stroke but once uh, it's gone beyond that then it is beyond any material administration known to us and anything which happens beyond that is 
it's easily termed as a miracle and we do have uh, instances where uh, a lot of people just somehow you know just uh, pop back to life and uh, those are beyond our material means we cannot really control that and it's beyond our material administration so therefore consciousness is not due to any amount of material combination but due to this this spirit soul which is all encompassing all enveloping now the influence of this atomic atomic soul can be spread all over this particular body which we have and uh, even according to the uh, upanishads this uh, atomic soul is situated in the heart of every living entity and because the measurement of this soul is beyond any material uh, measurements or appreciation uh, a lot of people end up uh, at least the researchers and the scientists um they end up stating that there is no soul but um even research and um, technology is unable to really fathom or understand this because we must know that even the largest particle accelerators even they have been unable to ascertain the properties of the smallest units of particle found till now and which are named as quarks and uh, these quarks uh, even after finding them there is still a possibility that we might find even further minute sub particles because to really understand the quarks they need to be broken down and to break them down you need these large huge uh, particle accelerators which run into kilometers of radius and you need the speed of light to really speed up these quarks so that they collide with each other and then break off so you can imagine the amount of uh, uh, economic means which needs to be pumped in into this research and the amount of technical prowess you need to have just to find out whether these also can be further broken down or not and yet we still don't know which is the smallest particle till date so the individual uh, atomic soul is it's definitely there in the heart along with what is termed as the super soul and uh, all of these energies of, of bodily movement are uh, it's all coming out from the heart so if you look at uh, the physiology and anatomy of the human body everything operates basically out of the heart heart region and heart area yes the the decisions and the logical parts and logical calculations they happen in the mind the brain but we must remember the brain needs oxygen and it needs blood supply so basically the entire body is functioning out of the heart area and uh, it is it is known that uh, the corpuscles the red blood corpuscles which carry the oxygen uh, from the lungs they gather energy from this heart center the soul and when the soul passes away from this position activity of the blood uh, all of this movement which happens with the blood it all ceases to be and uh, medical science also accepts the importance of the red corpuscles i think sukanya ji will also like to expand on that and uh, but it cannot be ascertained that the source of um, energy is the soul although we do accept that the red corpuscles are there but there's no way of finding out because it is so minutely ingrained but yes we do know that if the heart stops everything stops and so medicine does admit that the heart is the seat of all energies inside the body so such atomic particles of the spirit these can be compared to what we basically uh, feel when we go out uh, either for a walk in the park or going out for our work and that is the sunshine 
the, the rays of the sun, which are basically particles. These are light particles coming from the sun, which takes approximately, if I'm correct, around eight minutes to reach us. So it originated eight minutes back. So you're just seeing an echo of the sun's light. And in this sunshine, there are innumerable millions and millions of radiant molecules which fall on our face and bring a smile and also bring energy vitalization and uh, the much needed uh, energy to go about with our lives so similarly the fragmental parts of the supreme consciousness the supreme godhead these are also atomic sparks of of they are also the rays of the supreme lord which get distributed amongst all the other souls which are there right now. And this is what Sri Krishna is trying to bring to Arjuna, the appreciation, the understanding, the acceptance that there is something far bigger than what he is looking at right now. The, the personal individual drama, it is much smaller in comparison to the cosmic drama which is happening out there. And uh, the problem is we do not have that vision, even though we look up at the sky, which is blue, but once you pierce this uh, place called sky, we reach deep space, which is practically darkness. And there's hardly anything we know about it. We have sent across many uh, satellites and uh, devices but the understanding is probably at best minuscule if we could really say it, because the cosmos is infinite so similarly the supreme lord is the supreme godhead is infinite if you imagine his presence in the human body just imagine the presence inside every matter which is existing in the cosmos right now, whether it is matter, antimatter, light, darkness, whatever, it's all, all being covered by the Supreme Godhead and the Supreme Lord. And basically, this is where he's, Sri Krishna is trying to uh, inculcate a sense of uh, appreciation of the soul, because till Arjuna and in in many ways, till we, because he's referring to us also, till we don't understand, appreciate and accept the, the existence and the, the concept of the soul, uh, understanding any other thing would be very difficult because that is the ultimate energy inside everything. And so that is what is being spoken about in uh, verse 17 of chapter 2. So, over to you, Sukanyaji. Jai Shri Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Jai Um Always do such a wonderful um, explanation of um, what to me seems so simple in its translation like you know that no one can destroy what is everlasting right um, okay so it's as as Lord Krishna said that that part that is indestructible um is my understanding that uh, really is as the f words in my mind fight with each other uh, when I read something that seems so simple? Okay, um, it's um, the as JG said that it's is is. Um, as vast as the universe that we know, or we think we know. 
and um, that there's something there that pervades and permeates through all of this. Um, and that is indestructible. And that within us, we are also within the universe, really. The universe is not just out there. I mean, I imagine then somebody looking at the entire universe and observing the entire universe. And that is seeing the entirety of what is the essence of it as indestructible. Um, yet us being a part of it and having that soul which is indestructible and is a part of that entirety, the whole of it, yet we know that we have these bodies that we go through that which is destructible, right, which disintegrates. So there's this play of um, something that is beyond what I think of as me in a very... Uh, egoistic, small, minuscule way is really uh, uh, permeated by something that is so huge um, and that makes me a part of me, the, uh, the important part of me, um, part of this universe and a as one, yet it is seen separated into so many different parts um, and I have to just sit with that that concept of being a part of the indestructible having that as part of um, this body that which makes me alive um, as JG said you know it, it in the Upanishad it's it's said that the soul, that that indestructible soul that uh, Sri Krishna is referring to, it, is, it resides within the heart. Yet in, you know, medical science has been looking for it and looking for what is that spark because there's so many questions that come up in my mind as to when it does then if this body, which is destructible, is being created in a mother's womb, when, when does it receive that, um, that is indestructible, the soul? When, when does that happen? Does it happen when we uh, first notice a heartbeat in, in, in a fetus? Or is it after birth? There's so many, um, th there's still so many questions that we haven't been able to uh, really find an answer for that is tangible as we look for in data and, and uh, recordings and things like that in, in, um, in science, in Western science. Yet, at the same time, it, it boggles my mind as to how all of this w was written, spoken, understood by those thousands of years ahead of us. I mean, there are thousands of years ahead of us that that was a slip. Um, but they, this was thousands of years back in the past. Um, and we are still grappling with trying to figure out what it is. Um, and I know the Bhagavad Gita is saying that it resides in the heart. Um, honestly, now there's a lot of debate about is it the heart when it stops that we say that a life is done as we know it, or is it the brain? Because the brain survives uh, without oxygen a lot less longer than the heart can. Um, and there's a debate constantly, you know, we know of. Um, in, in hospitals and medical science and ICU when you have people who are um, 
at that line of are they alive, are they not? Do we continue to sustain their lives um, artificially? Uh, their heart is working, let's say, but they had a stroke. And we know that if we did not give them support, um, their heart is pumping away, but not necessarily are they responding. So then are they alive? Are they dead? Um, and if we withdraw that artificial support and, you know, take away the intubated intubation, so the the, the machine that's pumping um, the blood and helping the person breathe necessarily, um, the pumping of the blood might be going on with the heart because it wasn't affected, yet the breathing was not revived uh, without medical help. So does that mean that the person is alive or are they dead? So there are still things that medical science has not been able to quite grasp. And sometimes we have those very uh, big moral dilemmas when we are trying to help patients and their families, rather, make a decision whether to withdraw support or not. Um, because there are cases where the person has been unconscious, not revived, consciousness never came back, um, yet their heart did not stop. Uh, but they're unresponsive, so they're not conscious as we know it. Um, so in those cases, um, you know, people who are standing around them are making, are trying to make a decision on whether this person's, I guess, if I were to use the terms we have been using here, the soul. Is there a person's soul there still? Um, is it not? I mean, in terms of being in a hospital as a physician, we don't talk about the soul. And that's interesting that we don't talk about the soul, yet we know that there's medical science has never quite been able to tell when does a person or a fetus come alive, what is that spark? Um, so it's, it's, to me, such a simple, maybe, statement just at a glance, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the word per, for word translation, if I were to look at it again, um, Give me one second. You know, that which pervades the entire body, um, know that it is, uh, know it to be indestructible. It pervades everything. It pervades something that we identify all our lives as, you know, I identify this body as Sukanya. Yet this is not what is indestructible. It is something else. Uh, as J.G. was saying, it's it's so minuscule, yet it is so vast. It's I just find this concept just so hard to wrap my mind around um, because it's that um, it pervades the entire universe. And don't even I can't even get started on the fact that we know that the universe is expanding. So the universe is alive itself in some ways. It's expanding like a body would grow, like a child would get taller, bigger as they grow. It's like that. It's this universe, the body that is this huge body that's growing. And something that pervades it, just like something that, pervades our physical human bodies, that part is indestructible. Um, so no one can cause the destruction of that, that, that which we are calling the soul. And that's, that same thing pervades this huge universe, the body of universe, which is growing and expanding like a, 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 a giant child. And it's that that we haven't seen, haven't felt, 
we just have a sense that it's there, but I don't know how to touch it. And that, that unseen thing is what's indestructible. I think it's something that I just have to sit with and contemplate. Um, and so I'll rest my words at that and um, invite JG or anyone else from the audience or on stage to please uh, help me understand further what this infinite vastness is about. Jay Shri Krishna. Anybody else would like to offer or speak their thoughts on this? You can raise your hands if you want to come up. But really speaking, um, the thing is that our ego tends to overshadow everything which is known to us and in many ways uh, what happens is uh, we end up treating what's extraordinary as ordinary so in that sense we tend to overlook life itself um, and by life um, the usual uh, connotation is that Whenever you ask, like, how is life going? It's usually um, connected with the work you're doing or what you're eating or um, usually your day-to-day -day activities. But life in, in reality is beating inside you. It's, it's there every moment. The breath you take, the heartbeats which are there. And... Uh, we tend to overlook that and uh, that heartbeat each of those heartbeats um, those are the moments of existence because uh, it's common medical knowledge like uh, if the ECG uh, is showing uh, ups and downs on the graph it means you're alive if it falls flat means the heart has stopped working. So in many ways, um, the functioning of the heart is at the core of everything and uh, it's there where the seat of existence really lies. So in many ways, if you really look at the ECG also, it sort of depicts what life is also all about. Um, life is about going and doing work and uh, doing your duties. And uh, in that ways, you might go up or you might go down. Your uh, emotional uh, responses, your sensory perceptions might go up or down. But then that is life. That's how it is because we react to everything seasons, uh, external stimuli, external uh, environment, ambience. And basically it is our reaction to those with, due to which we know that life is happening right now, right? Because uh, when you're asleep, life is still happening, but it's just that your eyes are closed. But since your eyes are closed does not mean that existence has stopped. It is still going on. The sun still rises. Everything moves around. The animals are still waking up. But we tend to center it around us so much that we start to think that, um, start to think more like an ostrich with its head uh, buried under inside the earth and thinking that the world has stopped existing or the danger has passed, but 
in reality that does not happen so in many ways um, life cannot be avoided so it's usually one of the signs of uh, when we are recovering from illnesses or uh, when you're, when we are not in a good state of mind there's a the, you have a slight headache or something or the other you tend to sleep more uh, on those days because the body or at least the mind gives the signals to the body that uh, hey you need some rest so and that's when you hit the bed and go to rest but that headache or that disorder or that ailment is only limited to you so it is that individual experience those uh, pains or those pleasures are inside you and it's not really shared by others somebody else might be jumping with joy whereas you are on the bed trying to recover and overcome this excruciating pain inside you and uh, so you cannot understand the other's happiness and that person cannot understand your sickness and how you're feeling right now and that's where this this verse really comes in that uh, it's it's trying to show you that uh, what you might be going through it might not be the actual truth it it might not be the actual reality of existence it's your uh, perception of that existence so if you really look at it when you are going um, out with your friends or uh, with your family or just with someone else and it's a rainy day somebody might start jumping and dancing in the rains whereas some other person or you probably might think uh, my clothes are getting dirty i'm getting wet and uh, it's I don't like this feeling so it's all perception the rain is the same it hasn't changed it's just rain that's all it falls on everything like the plants the buildings the cars and everything else it is falling equally and it's treating everything equally it does not really discriminate or think that oh since there is this premium brand of car kept over here i should not do something to it no it will in fact if it's on the mountain side like how we are getting the news right now of uh, landslides and flash floods and cloud bursts in uh, the northern part of india where nothing is spared and uh, most of us must have seen one of those videos on the news in uh, kinnor uh, himachal pradesh where there's a landslide happening and there's these boulders of rocks just tumbling down the hill and somebody is recording it and then this one soul alone uh, rock fl- comes flying in into the frame and it just crashes the entire bridge the only bridge which is connecting uh, the houses to the other part if you look at it, it the, the rock looks really small compared to the bridge and uh, it looks really harmless till the point it makes contact with the bridge and then you know that this thing has immense power inside it because of gravity because of the um, because of the uh, the energy the kinetic energy which has been provided to this rock tumbling down all the way from the top of the hill and you know gaining momentum and all that energy inside it so much so that it can create a force even though it might not be able to break it while it is standing when it is in motion it has the power to break down that entire bridge and break that connectivity so if you really see power can come from anywhere and even inanimate objects can get that energy and power so it does have something inside it it does have atoms and molecules which get charged up when it receives that energy from existence and that existence is all around like gravity can can we really touch or feel or experience we can still experience gravity but we cannot really have anything that can really say that okay this is gravity i can point to a glass of water or a pen or a pencil near me and say that oh this is a pencil 
but I cannot say that for gravity. Neither can I say that for the air, which we so um, gladly uh, exclaim and uh, we accept that it's the only thing which is needed for our survival. You need breath of air, but the air which you're breathing, nobody has seen it unless you see it through the context of something else or the contact of something else. You see the trees moving, then you say, yes, there is wind, there is air. When you see a balloon uh, inflating, you say, yes, that air is there. So it's only with respect to something, in connection with something that we tend to identify or understand. But that's a limited understanding because that means the air is always there, but just because now you're pumping it into something else, now you exclaim that, uh, oh, the air is there. But it was always there from the beginning itself. So the understanding, the limitation is inside us. The, the ego, the logic, the mind is just putting a blanket on all our senses of understanding. And so basically, we're only stuck at the Tarka stage, not moving into the Vitarka. The Tark being the, the, the ground state uh, logic, the materialistic logic, which we can, you know, two plus two, four, like that, you know, just if this, then that, if this, then that. But it does not really help us in moving into the Vitarka stage, which goes beyond these material things. It goes much, much into the deeper levels. And that is what Sri Krishna is attempting to take Arjuna into. Although Arjuna is still in the very sensory and uh, human level where he's still not uh, reached a similar state of consciousness or conscience as Sri Krishna. But it is the duty that is what Sri Krishna is always claiming that it's his duty even though he's the creator, he's the manager of, uh, caretaker of all beings, living or non-living, he cannot just sit around watching all the play happen. He has to come and really take care, like really get his hands dirty. If you would have seen a farm and a farmer, you do not... Uh, see a farmer sitting inside the house and then just saying, oh, the crop will grow on its own. No, he has to pound and plunder the earth and turn it around and do all sorts of things. If he were to go gentle with the earth, there will be no crop at all. And similarly, if you place a seed on a rock, nothing will happen. It will just sit there doing nothing at all because that's not the condition of growth. It has to be placed into and mixed with the soil to be really growing into something which can benefit someone, maybe humans or maybe someone else, but someone or something. And that's where we need to understand that there is some effort which needs to go in. You cannot really just sit. So if Shri Krishna is doing the work of the caretaker and coming and doing it himself, we also need to pick up where he is showing us where the work is to be done, where we have to understand our duties and abide by them. Even though, even though he's saying, even though there are pains and pleasures and everything attached with the uh, materialistic human body, we still need to overcome it because they've been given as, as a sort of a, you know, a way to, uh, beautifully manifest and uh, manage these things together and then arrive at this wonderful, uh, you could say, resonance of uh, frequencies where we, what we think happens immediately. Because right now, we're in the stage where we create bucket lists and most of that list still remains in the bucket. It never gets completed. And most of the life just goes away. Whereas we really need to be spontaneous rather than just keeping things on our to-do list. It should be when you get up, 
you do the work and then you sit back otherwise it's you, it you don't you just don't need to do it then because it's just going to stay there as a to-do list on your schedule so in many ways there are a lot of uh, deep implications um, on this and um, he's uh, basically bringing in the concepts of uh, of the vedas the upanishads and um, and combining them and uh, really presenting it to arjuna and all of us in a way in which we can really understand because um, all of the ancient knowledge was lost in in between and uh, that's where shri krishna is taking up the task of bringing that knowledge back into the limelight into the spotlight because uh, it is needed at that time it's the turning of the time periods of the ages and so this knowledge this piece of wisdom which was lost or which was uh, forgotten for quite a long time this needs to be brought back so that it applies to people and it really helps people come out of their um, of their personal pains and personal pleasures and uh, really ascend into something else really transcend into a different state where these things even if they come they don't matter because if you remember every year the seasons come and go the summer season just passed away and uh, the monsoon season is here in in the parts of india and if you really look at it it's just season after season coming and going and the emotions are similar to that just that the seasons have a longer cycle compared to our emotions our emotions could change within the fraction of a second so we are almost uh, as fidgety right now that our emotions keep going up and down every second it is changing so in that way is um, when that is the truth then we need to do something about it because if we keep moving along this spectrum of the emotions so frequently how do you think will we ever grasp what shri krishna is trying to tell here because first of all to just be able to listen to the words which he is saying i'm not even going into you know listening or understanding or trying to interpret what he's saying just the basic action of listening you at least need to be in a stable steady state if the emotions are fluctuating so high there's no way any word can reach your mind because something is going on inside your mind already and that drama is much much more bigger than what's coming out outside so in that ways uh, the first task is to really bring back the mind to a state of stability and steadiness to really first listen because once you start listening and then hearing and then you start analyzing and interpreting what is being said only then can it become something for you so basically bhagavad gita is all about action and i'm not talking of action as in the action movies but this is action inside you because action happens inside you all the time but this is action which liberates you from this bondage of materialistic things of these pains and pleasures we are always attached to it and once that that attachment breaks that bond breaks with it then you are separated from everything and then you can really see things for what they are just imagine you're just standing or riding on, along a busy highway with wherein you know the the traffic is high and the speeds are low and you're just going at a slow pace and there's something um, there's a there's a beautiful flower which you see along the road side now you can't really see that while you're driving right you have to stop by you have to come to a standstill get out from the car 
walk up to that flower if it is slightly away from the road bend down probably go down on your knees or at least bend down from your back and really admire the flower which is there so you have to do all these things to just see and admire the flower then it depends on whether you want to pluck it out and take it away with you to your home or to your office or keep it in your car but you have to stop somewhere so this is where uh, shri krishna is basically trying to stop this flow of emotions happening inside arjuna as well because if those emotions don't stop there's no way you can uh, even listen to what he's saying or uh, what he's trying to inculcate inside of us because these are very deep topics and these are very deep subjects which require a lot of uh, a lot of understanding a lot of uh, patience and stability that ways so yes um what do you sukanya ji would you like to add something or somebody from the audience would like to add something to this mm, yes i would love to invite somebody else's thoughts on this because i think i'm just going around in a circle in my mind <laughs> um and and that fight i mean and this is a very personal fight that i'm speaking of as a physician i trained in the western science and yet knowing the vastness and the depth of uh, our wisdom that have been uh passed down for thousands of years orally before it was even written I'm not even trying to I'm not even going to go into the fact that wow what who were these amazing conscious souls uh beings that understood this and have written that and then Shri Krishna wow um and that's the part in me that you know the very finite <laughs> understanding of just the the medical i'm coming from a very uh physiological medical uh background and think trying to trying to bridge both and trying to make sense of it and the solace i'm finding is more from the culture and the heritage that i belong and the the understanding that i'm trying to grow and cultivate in myself the solace i find is in that the of all these questions um because i know it's it's the search of the soul and what gives something someone life that question still um isn't answered in western science um but the vastness of all this of what lord shri krishna has said um even though i remember i distinctly remember my mom teaching me about uh when i was a child reading to me um about the universe and both of us like after she would read and describe the different planets the galaxies and how the universe is expanding you know and this was many 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 years ago we would just look at each other and and think about the vastness that my dad had bought a beautiful encyclopedia for kids and that had beautiful um drawings and pictures and photographs in it and i'd be looking at that and looking at whatever was discovered at that point in the 70s i guess and drawings of things and just wondering it's just getting to a point where my mind would be so boggled with the vastness of it and then coming to this stage of my life and having a western understanding of the body and when it's alive when it's not as we understand it so far um and even western science knows that there is that point that point that we haven't been able to bridge as to when are we alive and when are we dead and where is that um is it the soul 
is it an electrical impulse uh, that is there one in the heart and then it stops and then we're dead? Is it that? Is is that what the soul is? Um, because as you spoke, uh, JG, about the EKG, uh, and I'm, I, I know I'm bringing it into very um, minuscule, uh, I don't know, uh, tangible things, which does not explain begin to explain even um, that which is spoken in the Bhagavad Gita by Sri Krishna. Um, but I take solace in the fact that that which he spoke about, that which is the whole that, that pervades through this universe, through you, me, everybody hearing us uh, right now, that essence is indestructible. And that is what is making, I guess, the universe expand until it won't. Um, and collapse into... Uh, something that is antimatter. Okay, I'm not even... Um, I'm going to stop there because I'm just confusing myself and everybody that I'm probably um, speaking to at this time. Um, I just, I guess I take solace in the fact that knowing that, that what he was talking about as he was talking to Arjuna um, is even if your arrows pierce the body of your cousins, your family uh, members, your loved ones across the battlefield. You cannot, Arjuna, you and your arrows cannot destroy what is part of this universe. And essentially, I suppose, Sri Krishna. Um, what he's going to see disintegrate is just that part that is the recyclable part of the body, I guess. A uh, recyclable part of this planet, the universe. Um, it just comes in different forms. But it's that intangible um, soul and the consciousness that's what gives it, quote-unquote, life. And that is indestructible. Um, so at this time, I'll rest my words because I can't go beyond that at all um, in, 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 in explaining myself and what I am feeling, um, not feeling, trying to say, uh, and, and invite anybody else if there's anybody who would like to speak um, and give us a, a different experience. Uh, look at this this uh, verse 17 these do come up if not Jay maybe we can um, rest it here yes I think if um, there are no further comments we can close down um, we're almost close to uh, our closing time actually Yes, Jatin, Namaste. Yeah, um, Mishwaya, I'm Jatin. I'm basically from Kerala. So I I think I was late uh, for this discussion. Uh, but uh, what I had gained from the verse is like uh, Krishna is telling us friend, his uh, best friend who is Arjuna, that uh, the soul, you are thinking that if you kill uh, these people, they will be, uh, there will be no more and it will be grief on your side that you are going to kill them. But the soul is not there. 
and you're also even if you also die the soul is there and you're not just a body and you are just in the as uh, uh, having a bad body of arjuna but doesn't mean that you you don't have a soul and the soul doesn't have death and it is not it is imperishable and also it says that uh, the soul imperishable the imperishable soul whose existence is the reality and delineated and emphasized in a gentle manner by krishna and the thing is that uh, what uh, krishna is meaning is that you need to know that uh, e- even if the body is gone it is not possible to modify the soul which is imperishable and impossible to destroy and also what uh, he is meaning is endlessly not limited by space or eternal indestructible is a thing that's called as soul and it cannot be destroyed by the curse or magic or or by anything or by arrows or by vehicles or whatever means and also it it is like while being unable to be destroyed it is immutable also and also he says that uh, this is uh hence even if you are having the grief that you are going to kill the people kill your own people and you will not be able to meet them or you are going to be the reason of their death it's not like that but you are being the you are doing your karma and uh, you are just allowing them to get uh, uh like a moksha uh, soon uh, because of the presence of krishna and basically i think most of the people who died during the uh, kurukshetra yuddha because of the presence of uh, bhagwan krishna who is the supreme god who is the creator administrator and destructor so i think uh, most of them got eternal bliss because of the presence just even if they uh, they were a, just a small store soldier or a horse rider or whatever it is whoever who was present and died during the battlefield when they were doing the karma as attained eternal bliss and they didn't have any compact to the world because of just mere presence of uh, bhagwan krishna so the krishna what uh, I, according to my understanding what he meaning is hey arjuna uh, don't be afraid that you are going to kill your mama ji or your uncle or your brother or your uh, whoever it is your great grandfathers and all bishma drona and all it is just the uh, outer part of the body it means the, the 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 dress which is covering the soul is going to get destroyed but they are still there as eternal bliss and as soul you need to understand that Ar- arjuna you know, Ar- arjuna you need to understand that drona charya or or uh, uh, duryodhana or uh, ashwatthama or whoever it is uh, is not just the outer covering of the of the body it is just removal when a person dies uh, it, it is just like the de- the process of death is just like you remove the clothes whenever you wear it and the next day you are you are wearing it wearing a new one so krishna was in informing him in a, a simple way in which you are of the grief that you are going to kill your own people and you will not be you you would be missing them but in actual meaning you are not going to miss anybody but uh you are you and they are connected always connected even though you might be fighting each other or as enemies or even though brothers or your uncle or your great fathers or your gurus you are connected with soul and there is no there is no sadness or enmity or or any kind of evil things for the soul the soul is supreme and soul has only one well being of friendship and good virtues and good kind of relationship with each and every person so this is what i i have understood from that first uh, i would like to sum up here and over to jay if at all anything is to be added yes thank you jethi um yeah i think that was uh, we covered it pretty well and uh, it's uh, 
in in many aspects um, this uh, chapter chapter 2 is uh, pretty important because uh, it sets the tone for the entire bhagavad gita and in many ways it's uh, sort of a an essence of the entire bhagavad gita as well and um, which is why we are also taking it slowly uh, verse by verse and uh, really try to discuss it from all angles so that we can uh, really arrive at a place where we can practically apply this to our lives and uh, that's the that's where the magic happens when we turn these verses these words into actual life and actual action and uh, which is the basic goal of uh, shri krishna he does not want us to simply keep these as books uh, or words written on paper and um, really try and make it a part of our lives and uh, when when we say part of our lives it it should become as if i were to really give a very very simplistic example uh, you no know, turn something like how you don't begin your day without having a bath or uh, having you know brushing your teeth so in many ways it has to become like that something which you do not miss to do every moment practically because these are things which will keep us steady in our action and uh, really keep us focused on our work on our duties on our karmas so that at the end of the the time we have really um, worked as per the cosmic plan the individual plans keep coming in between they they will be there that's okay but the cosmic plan is really important because that's the why we are here we can have all the plans in the world but once the cosmos wants to ruin your plans it's not going to be your day and all of us have seen this in some form or the other when the day is not right when the work you are supposed to which at least which you think you are supposed to go and do and it does not happen there are n number of things maybe it might rain heavily something or the other will happen something will break down in your house so it looks very very uh, you know it looks like causation on the face of it it looks very simple that uh, maybe yeah it just happened you know it just happened out of the blue but that's the point when something does not need to happen it will not happen without the permission of the cosmos and we can try all that we want to do um, it at that point of time but it just does not happen so in actuality our plans and our actions our deeds need to align with that of the cosmic plan because if we are in that uh, alignment nothing can stop us because then the cosmos will be with you because even though if we think oh there are factors you know like economic factors government factors and then oh my own skills and all there is always a hidden factor you know that act of god why do we call it as act of god because that one thing is beyond any definitions which we can provide to we've got definition for everything and when all definitions end that is where the definition of act of god begins so you can clearly make out this difference so we really need to align with that act of god and not really you know worry about all these other factors because these will fall in place they will truly fall in place if we are uh, in alignment with uh, the work to be done so i think uh, it's been a wonderful session and uh, a wonderful um, journey of this verse and uh, i think this will be a good note to um, really uh conclude the session and uh uh keep this for the next week the next verse so 
all those who are with us over here this is the bhagavad gita from the beginning room and uh, you are in the healing and meditation club and uh, yes as you can see we are going verse by verse from the bhagavad gita and uh, we just uh, discussed chapter 2 verse 17 and um, we will be doing this so this is a weekly room so we are going to now meet uh, on the next wednesday 10:30 pm indian standard time but for all of our regular club members uh, all of us know that we will be meeting again at uh, 8 am indian standard time for our uh, 108 mahamrityunjay mantra jap room so um i'll just conclude the session with the shanti mantra so that we can close off at the end om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya asato ma sadgamaya tamaso ma jyotirgamay mrityor ma amritam gamay aum shanti 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 लोका समस्त सुखिनो भवन्तु लोका समस्त सुखिनो भवन्तु लोका समस्त सुखिनो भवन्तु ओम शांति 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 So with the blessings of Lord Shri Krishna and the promise to meet next week Wednesday 10:30 p.m. in the Bhagavad Gita room we will close out on the count of 3 and at the end please join me in saying Jai Shri Krishna 3 2 1 Jai Shri Jai Shri Krishna